Road Trip Through the Southwest, New Year's 2017-2018. We decided to take a road trip over New Year's to Green Valley, Arizona to see the Titan Missile Museum, to White Sands, New Mexico to see the pure white dunes that stretch for miles, to the Carlsbad Caverns to see the caverns underground, to Abilene, Texas to feel utter cold, and then to Austin, Texas to enjoy the city life, food, and just good cheer of that city. Lastly, on the way back, we stopped through Scottsdale, Arizona to see where the Dodgers do their spring training. And a month later, we would come back to actually watch that spring training occur. Enjoy. Hey, this is Fred. We're going to go to the Titan Missile Museum here in Green Valley, Arizona. So we've got Susie all ready to go. Backpack. Little backpack. Susie, do you come with French fries? White Sands, New Mexico. It's amazing. There's dunes everywhere. You gotta see this. It's a national park. Come and check it out.
towards a town called Artesia, which is near the Carlsbad Caverns. We're going to stay there tonight and possibly a second night. Tomorrow we're going to see the Carlsbad Caverns. Hey folks, we're about 40 or 50 miles east of the border of New Mexico. We're probably going to stop in a second at a Dairy Queen so I can get some nice ice cream. And then we're going to keep going eastbound. Oh, here it is, my Dairy Queen. It's called the Butterfield Station. Inside there is a Dairy Queen. Hey guys, we're going to the Carlsbad Caverns. I invite you to come along. Okay, well here we are. We're in front of the uh, Carlsbad Caverns entrance, so we're just about to go in and see what it looks like down there. Hey, this is Fred. We just finished the Carlsbad Caverns tour, but the elevator which we took down is totally full going up. So we're walking the mile a quarter, 800 feet up, 80 stories. It's tiring. We're almost out here. Brenda's right behind me. Oh my God, that was tiring. Okay, so we're just about to come out of the tunnel now. Of the cave now. That's the entrance. Okay. All right, I made it. Oh my god, so tired. 800 feet, 80 stories, 1.25 miles. I'm so tired. Hey, Fred, so how was it? Are you tired? Did a, <laughs> a good job. Good I job. think I wore too many clothes. First addendum story between Artesia, New Mexico and Abilene, Texas. As told to you from a hotel room once we got to Austin, Texas. Please note that I had just finished driving 1,541 miles, so I sound a bit exhausted here. 
between when we left Artesia, New Mexico, which is where we saw the Carlsbad Caverns, to go to Albaline, Texas. Um, we were driving down some country roads and um, we finally were in one part, maybe about halfway through that evening drive when we were on a divided road and we were driving along. <clears throat> it had been really foggy, like most of the drive, really foggy. These are like small country roads. Like I said, we'd gotten onto a divided road that would be something like, sort of like San Vicini in Los Angeles. That's got two lanes on one side, two lanes on the other, but not nearly as populated, obviously. And it was a very straight road. And I was keeping an eye on a Jeep that had passed me and he was in the number two lane like I was. And um, he had passed me. I think it was a it was a different colored Jeep. It was like a Laredo. So I was watching the lights and he was, I'd say about a quarter mile ahead of me. So I just keep an eye on the tail lights because I knew it was a straight road and I knew that it was also very foggy, you know? And um, at this point it wasn't quite as foggy and that's why I could see about a quarter mile, I'd say. Somewhere between an eighth of a mile and a quarter mile. I also knew that in behind me was a truck. I thought it was a semi truck, but it turned out to be <clears throat> like a large work truck. And um, anyway, so I was I was keeping an eye on the Jeep in front of me. And then the Jeep slowly veered off into the number one lane. And I saw that he was passing an SUV that was in the number two lane also ahead of me. So I was just about to start veering into the number one lane when I saw that Jeep in front of me switch really quickly back in the number two lane, like a really sharp jolt. And what happened was, as soon as he moved, I was trying to figure out, well, was he going to hit a cow or was he going to hit a parked car? Or was he going to hit something in the road, like a couch or something? Because he moved out of the way so quickly. Well, it turned out all I could see was just another car coming the other way, which at first I thought was in the other side of the street, but it was in the number one lane, wrong way driver coming towards him. He got out of the way and then pretty quickly was up upon me. But in those moments, I quickly went into the shoulder of the right shoulder. So when he passed me, he was in number one lane. I was on the shoulder. And then the truck behind me had to veer out of the number one lane because he was actually in the number one lane, unlike me in the Jeep. And then there was another car behind the truck that also had to veer out of the number one lane. And anyways, so Brendan and I and the few cars around us kind of were a little bit stunned and kind of pulling off the shoulder. I called 911, told him what had happened. Brendan and I proceeded into the town because we were, like I said, probably just, you know, within a mile of the town. I don't remember what the town was called now. It was one of the last towns you could be in the very southeast part of New Mexico. So we drove into the town. We kind of just parked for a second. And then I turned on my scanner and I could hear some calls going out. And then we turned around to see like, did he ended up hitting anybody or anything like that? And as we were turning around, we went back out of the town going, I guess it would be westbound. And we saw on the side, two cars had pulled over a silver truck, two um, police cars, and they had all their lights on and everything. We kept on going just out of town to see like where this had all happened. We were on the other side of the road, just see had anybody been hit or anything like that. We, we passed a mile marker where we knew we, we were, which was between mile marker and 99 and 100. So we knew nothing had happened there. Turn around and came back into town. And then we stopped and talked to the police that had pulled over the silver truck. I asked the policeman, we were on the other side of the road, kind of parked. And I asked the policeman, he came over to me. I said, was that the wrong way driver? He said, yep. He said, um, after you called, we looked around for him. We saw him driving, wobbling around in the town. And so we pulled him over and he was arrested, drunk driving. So that was one story. This is our windows. Hey, it's Fred. We're in Abilene, Texas, and it is cold here. Look at this. 22 degrees, and it's, this This is not true that it's 9.53. It's actually 11.53, because I don't change my time. I, I just use my phone. But if you can see the texture of the freezing up here, it's crazy. We're gonna be really careful driving to Austin today from Abilene. But anyways, we're at a gas station right now. There's Brenda. And Susie's back here somewhere, as usual. Yeah. So we're just gonna get ourselves further south. We should warm up a little bit. Hey guys, so we're just driving from Abilene, Texas to Austin, Texas, as I said earlier. The thing is, the roads are literally frozen. It's 19 degrees. If you accelerate even the slightest bit, the car like starts to fishtail a little bit. So everybody on the road here is 
driving about like 30 to 35 miles an hour on roads that would normally be 75 miles an hour. And the funny thing is, well, it's not funny actually, but we've already passed um, two wrecks. One was a big rig that just was going around a turn too fast and it was totally messed up in the ditch and they were towing it out. Second addendum story between Abilene, Texas and Austin, Texas. As told to you from a hotel room once we got to Austin, Texas. Please note that I had just finished driving 1,541 miles, so I sound a bit exhausted here. The second story, this is even scarier. If that could be, this could even be scarier. The next night, after we'd been, we were in Abilene, and it was extremely cold. It was like 19 degrees. There was frost, not even frost, there was ice. It was hard ice all over my car. And what we did is we left that morning, got gas. I talked to a few people at the gas station. They said it was extremely icy. And one guy looked like a hunter, a really big hunter guy, and he had a big truck. He said, I don't care what people look at me or what, I stay 40 miles an hour on the interstate. He said, I don't care who passes me or what looks they give me, but I'm not going any faster because when I see people passing, me, I say to myself, I'll see you in a few minutes because you'll be crashed on the side of the road. It was really icy. We needed now to get from Abilene down to Austin. So like really slowly pulled out of the town. We drove really carefully, literally 30 miles an hour, like most of the way. And if you look at a map and just kind of do a Google search from Abilene to Austin, it'll show you what little roads you'll be taking. Um, the whole way was like 30 miles an hour, no joke. Actually just pulling out of Abilene, we saw a tractor trailer that had crashed on the road. It was like jackknifed and they were trying to pull it out of a ditch. We stopped in a town, one of the little towns, it was called Rising Star. I'd been joking with Brenda that I had to stop through one of the dollar stores in that town just to see what they look like. <laughs> and when I went into one in Rising Star. We had passed another one we didn't go into. We passed one in Rising Star. I pulled, turned around, went into it. It was really organized. There was a nice lady there. I asked her if there was any kind of like Texas barbecue or anything around. She said, not right now. Everything's frozen. There's not a lot of like things open, especially in that town. It has like 480 people or something in that town. So it's very small. And um, I was noticing the dollar store that it was so organized. That was funny. It was like really, basically everything was untouched. Everything was organized on the shelf. They just don't have a lot of people there. So the store just kind of sits there. So afterwards we got in my car, proceeded to drive very slowly. We were about two and a half miles east of Rising Star, Texas, when in front of us there was a curve that was like to my vision curve to the right a car it looked like the size of about a small suv silver maybe like a subaru or kia or something like that i don't remember had texas plates this car was about a quarter mile in front of us and it came around that corner at probably about 65 miles an hour and it started to go sideways so its nose started facing to the left so like off the road and brenda for a second said is he trying to turn onto that driveway and i said he's not turning any driveway he's slipping he slipped onto the grass off the road and then he hit a dirt driveway that led to a farm he'd gone through a fence basically like a i guess it was a barbed wire fence or something and then hit the driveway which went to a farm because the driveway is kind of if you imagine it's kind of dirt and it's lifted it's like it's at the same grade as the road so it's lifted from the shoulder grass that's to the side of the road so basically he hit it flipped up and flipped his car over and then hit a silo so we drove up i pulled over and the car's upside down i pulled a little past the event because I felt like there's an emergency vehicles or anything like that needed I needed to be a little further away even though I was on the other side of the road I was going eastbound this car was going westbound so what happened was I stopped my car put my flashers on well to the side of the road because I was afraid other vehicles could like slide or whatever and then I called 911 I got to tell you it felt really uncomfortable doing this that I was sitting there in my car in a warm car calling 911 when meanwhile Brenda could see looking back that it looked like a kid like with a red sweatshirt got out of the car and was running around the car. We didn't know exactly what was happening, but your first instinct is to want to run to the car. But I knew it was such a bad crash that I had to call 911. So it was like about three minutes sitting in my car while all this was sitting on the side of the road going on, like off in a farmer field. So that was what was uncomfortable for me because I felt like I wasn't helping, but I knew my instinct was to call 911 because anything you're doing in the meantime, like if you're trying to run to the car, doing anything, the police and fire could be on their way. I know I did the right thing, which is my first instinct, call the 911, get them going. I told them exactly where it was. Somehow I knew that we we're right about two and a half miles east of Rising Star. It was a really good estimation I made. I got out of the car just as I was getting out, another guy pulled up behind me and ran across the road. And then a woman in a white car coming westbound down the same direction as the person who had the accident pulled over. She got out of her car. She had two kids in her car. 
We all ran to the scene. Now, what I thought was a kid running around the car was actually a guy. He was about 25 years old. He had a red sweatshirt. He pulled off his sweatshirt and was trying to get his girlfriend out of the passenger seat. The car's flipped over. The roof's pretty much crushed, but still has some room. And the girl is hanging upside down. When we got up there, I could hear her saying that she couldn't get her legs out or she was all caught somehow in there. Because when you see that, is when only you realize what a mess it is because there's so much stuff in the car, like hanging and, you know, like seeing seats partially out and it's just it was just such a mess his instinct he was trying to pull her out me and the guy and the girl kind of chimed in too the woman we said don't move her we don't know what happened to her what's going on with her she was bleeding though from her head so the really nice woman who had pulled up in the white car she pulled out a sweater from her car or she gave it to me i gave it to the boyfriend to put it on her head because he was like on the ground trying to reach for his girlfriend. The other guy who'd pulled up in the red car behind me, he was also kind of doing the same thing I was, which was telling him, don't move her. You know, the police are on their way, fire's on their way. Another woman drove up and she had black pants on as I remember, dark hair. And she um, was a nurse because she, she walked up and I said, and she looked like she was confident walking out of the scene kind of. And I said, are you a nurse? I just had a feeling she was. She said, yeah, I'm an RN. So thank God, you know, so she actually took that sweater that I'd given the boyfriend and wrapped it around the girl's head who was hanging upside down because she'd seen a lot of trauma. And she did a really good job, like, just keeping the girl in good shape. Then after that, a guy drove up in a silver car. I kind of went away from the accident to wait on the road because it was about 30 yards maybe because he'd crashed into the field kind of. So I was at the road now, and a guy in a silver car uh, truck came up, and then he just asked what was going on. I told him, he kind of, I was glad he put his truck there because he put his truck in a place where if other cars were gonna slide or anything, it was gonna kind of protect where I was standing. And then just in a few minutes, the poli a police uh, or sheriff came up. I'm not sure if it was a Texas sheriff or a policeman, but he drove up in like a station wagon, a black station wagon with um, police, uh, you know, emblems. Came out, jeans, you know, kind of jacket, tough looking Texas. And, you know, really, really good man. And he, um, the first thing he asked me is, where's the driver? I said, the driver's right there with his shirt off, trying to get his girlfriend, like, situated or, like, holding on his girlfriend. And so he, he got that guy. I think he wanted to see if he was, like, intoxicated or anything like that. He put him in his police car. He also assured everybody that the EMTs were on their way the firemen and everything. So then the, the firemen came, they helped get the woman out of the car. She had a really bad laceration. They got her out of the car somehow. I don't know what, how she was hanging or whatever. They needed a car to put her in. So me and the guy in the red car who first showed up, we went and got the girl in the white car's car. We got her car, we brought it up. There were two kids in it. I had them do little activity, like holding things in the car so they would feel like they were doing something. They're little kids like three and five years old. So I just introduced myself. I remember one kid said his name was Caleb. And um, so I gave him some iPads that were in the front seat, just clearing out the front seat so they could feel like they were helping somehow. We took the car, the guy in the red car actually was the one who drove this white car, put it next to the dirt driveway. And then, we, and then the fireman walked the girl who was really stammering. Like she was still like kind of in shock. And they put her in that seat just to let her be in a, a warm place. And then they worked on her. Then I gave the policeman my information because I was the one who called 911 at first. And I, and I saw the whole thing happen literally. So I gave Gave my information then Brent and I went off you know and continued towards Austin the whole way being really icy I was really glad I just knew to drive like 30 miles an hour the whole time so we got to Austin safe and uh, but it was crazy it was two, two major incidents we saw you know here we are in um, Rising Star Texas and we went to this um, family dollar store <laughs> and um, they said there's no Texas barbecue or anything around here because it's too small. So it's a really small town, so we're gonna go find it somewhere else.
Probably hard to see me because it's kind of dark in here, but we're now going to drive to um, Mount um, Bonnell in uh, Austin, Texas. Because I have a picture that we're trying to figure out where Brennan took a picture of me in like 1998 or something like that, whenever we came here, the only other time. And finally, I showed it to somebody after showing like Turn lots right of people, after showing a lot of people. And this guy goes, Oh, it's Mount Bonnell, that's where you were, and it overlooks the river. So I'm going to take a picture of myself, have Brennan take a picture of me there again. And it'll be funny because it was the same place we were at like 20, 21 years ago or something. Maybe 18 years ago. I don't know how long ago. And um, in half a mile, you'll arrive at Mount Bonnell. Do you hear that? And um, the only difference is going to be I, you know, weigh just a little bit more than I did back then. But it'll still be fun. Right or wrong.
we decided to come back to see Dodger Spring Training a month later. I was in the middle of getting a hot dog when the Star Spangled Banner started. Susie, lay down. Come on, Susie, come lay down. Come on, get in here. 